share with you over the course of the next half hour or so. Um, I think one of our challenges as we sit in this room, we're going to talk an awful lot about the top end of this uh, supply chain. We're going to talk about seed stock and the cow-calf. We've probably got the feeder uh, represented to some extent, the processor and consumer. Um, but we have to keep in mind, as Dr. Dyke reminds us, ultimately if we don't put a product on the plate, the consumer's value. And right now they value it tremendously because it's, it's expensive. It is expensive to enjoy beef. Um, we can't get that out of our mind. We've got to think about that as, as seed stock suppliers, as cow calf producers. Uh, but ultimately, if we don't produce a product that, that satisfies some consumer, recognizing in our industry, that means a lot of things. All right? Myself as a consumer, um, I enjoy those uh, premium choice products prime rib, recognizing that in my state of Virginia, and you get up in this part of the world, there is an awful lot of consumers that prefer grass-fed, organic, natural, whatever the case might be. Um, and consequently, the decisions that we make from a genetic standpoint and a management standpoint to address those different markets are, are a lot different. That's not the focus of my talk today, but I think that plays in and it's important to remember. I'm a university professor, so we have to go back to class. Uh, Lawrence started class. The good news is there will not be a quiz, okay? Three or four things just to remember, okay? If we're going to make genetic improvement, there's three primary areas that really impact that, okay? Accuracy of selection. How well can we identify superior genetics to move our uh, genetics in our herd or in the breed one way or another, however we like to do that? How intensely can we select within our population? Do the genetics exist to take us where we want to go? I think that has some implications as we talk about crossbreeding. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Generation interval, how long does it take to make genetic progress? As you all recognize, we have technologies and tools like AI. We have ET, those kinds of things which are going to help us. We're not going to talk about that too much. Um, accuracy selection really boils down to some of those things that have been touched on already. Okay. Accuracy, we have a good mechanism to measure that within the industry. We have tools like DNA. We have tools like total herd en enrollment, which helps that. Um, we have AI and those kinds of things. And so certainly accuracy is important. And anything we can do as particularly seed stock breeders to enhance accuracy, we're going to do nothing but help our commercial clientele and those commercial bull customers, so we need to focus on that. I can't answer this question on your behalf as a breed, but I think it's something to think about. Is there enough variation that exists within the breed? And this table just represent what's the top versus the bottom 20% on the percentile table. 
For some economically important traits like calf and yeast, weaning weight, marbling or quality grade, there's some differences. There tends to be a little more variation, if you will, weight in the hybrids than there is the purebreds. Is that a shock to us? Is that surprising? Would you expect that? <laughs> We'd expect that, wouldn't we? All right. Combining different breeds to make hybrids. So that's important, and I think as a breed, we need to continue to think about that. I'll talk some about genetic variation a little bit that Dr. Jones got into as, uh, as we went through. We've got lots of tools, okay? We've got lots of tools. Uh, and our customers, our commercial bull buyers, hope they're using all the tools. That includes crossbreeding. It includes EPDs. It includes accuracy of selection that we provide to them um, through the bulls that we provide. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those, uh, each one of those various sectors. Before I go any further, I'm going to make some assumptions. Hopefully we're all on at least in the same book chapter, if not on the same page on this stuff. As Dr. Jones so eloquently told us, maximum profitability in the cow-calf sector is associated with crossbreeding. Okay. Why is that? Primarily because of crossbred cow. Primarily. There are additional advantages, but primarily crossbred cow because of those things, her fitness traits, her fertility, her ability to breed back, stay in the herd longer, all those kinds of things. Secondly, we all recognize that British genetics are very important to our industry. There's the top three ranking British genetics in the beef business, Angus, Red Angus, and Hereford. They all have excellent gene pools that provide tremendous genetics to our herd from a national perspective. Okay? We also know, as has been already talked about, that when we cross those British breeds with continental breed like Simital, we can add a great deal to all sectors of the industry. Okay? We added cow-calf level, we added the feeder level, we added the packer level, and we added the consumer level. Okay? So I think it's a no-brainer to do all this. The question is how do we do it and what's important uh, as we do that. I thought I'd review real quickly, I guess, uh, as I work with, uh, on an educational role in my state and work with seed stock and commercial cattlemen, these kinds of questions come up an awful lot. Where do sim genetics rank relative to there's lots of ways we can do that. There's all kinds of data out there that helps support uh, what we're going to say here. I've got a couple different ways that I tend to look at it. Uh, all this table is is taking the across breed EPD adjustments, applying them to breed average of each breed. So relative differences that you see here are directly comparable across the breeds. It's the average genetic merit of an Angus bull versus a red Angus bull versus a Hereford bull versus your Simital and Simital hybrid bull. Okay. What does that tell us? What does that tell us Simital's good at? Muscle. 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 We're going to add red meat yield, aren't we? We're going to add muscle. We're going to add red meat yield. Okay. Probably going to give up some cabinets. Right? Got to manage that. Very competitive at growth. Early growth in particular, a little superior. But I think, as you all recognize, a lot's changed uh, over the last uh, three or four decades when it comes to that. Very similar in milk, and I'm mainly comparing to Black Angus on the top. Okay? But the opportunities, uh, and you combine those from a crossbreeding hybrid figure standpoint, as Dr. Jones pointed out, do nothing but uh, amplify themselves uh, and enhance as we move across. The data also tells us that Simital amongst continental breeds is very good in the breed of choice relative to calving ease, direct calving ease and maternal calving ease, age of puberty, weaning weight growth, yearling weight growth, post weaning growth if you will, quality grade compared to other continental breeds, and lots of measures of feed efficiency, particularly post weaning feed efficiency. Okay? So that's what we need to hang our hat on, and if I can get to my message real shortly, and real quick, I could probably do this in one or two slides, all right? This is what the Simital breed's good at. This is what we need to focus on and use the tools to do that. And if we do that, I think as a, as a breed, you're in an excellent position to have a great market share uh, within the industry as you currently do and continue to grow it 
um, as we move forward. <laughs> Lots has happened in the last three or four decades. Again, I'm not telling you something you don't know. It puts it in a little different perspective. Here's a graph that shows genetic trend over time. What's happened to the growth differences between continental and British trees? There. Okay. So no longer we do we talk about the continental breeds being the growth breeds and the British breeds being the maternal breeds. Simply not true anymore. Lots of reasons for that, which have already been talked about uh, and discussed. Okay? The thing that's unique and has not changed, despite our industry's efforts and focus on consumer traits, what's happened to carcass traits over that same time period? <coughs> Virtually nothing. They've remained unchanged. At least the relative breed differences have largely remained unchanged. Okay? Which further emphasizes, I think, the need for that continental British mix when we get to the end product, uh, the packer and the, and the consumer portion, not to mention the importance on the maternal cow side. I happen to have this slide in, and Dr. Jones just mentioned it. Okay? So those differences that used to exist between British and Continental, and in particular between Simital and Angus cattle, differences in mature size, which of course are directly related to cow size, which are related to cow intake and cow costs, along with those changes in growth which have disappeared, so have those differences in cow size. Okay? I'm not sure this message is totally understood by the industry. Uh, I think we need to do a better job from an education standpoint, people like myself and you folks in the audience, um, but I think it's very relevant uh, as moving forward. Okay? So we've touched on this. In my mind, here's what Simital needs to do. Okay? They need to be complementary to British genetics. In our part of the country, that means black eggs. Okay? That means they need to add muscle and red meat yield. They need to at least maintain, if not enhance, growth. Along with that, enhance efficiency, particularly on the uh, growth efficiency. They need to maintain maternal strength and add maternal value. And doing all that while maintaining as best we can the inherent quality grade advantages of some of those British breeds, namely marbling, okay? maintain calving yeast, maintain market acceptance, and in our part of the world that means coat color. Right, right wrong, or indifferent, our black ones worth more than red ones. My friend's from Virginia. Yes. Absolutely. Okay? I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's a fact. <laughs> and to ignore a fact is not very wise, my university professors told me. Um, and mature size, okay? We gotta keep our arms around that. So let's just switch gears and go to commercial breeding programs. A few thoughts on that, okay? What are your commercial customers, what's important to them? They sell pounds, right? Doesn't matter if they're selling a feeder calf, um, low half the calf crop and go into the weekly auction, or if they participate in a value added, wean, vaccinated, backgrounded, high value feeder calf sale with a fancy ear tag, right? or if they retain ownership and they feed their cattle in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, it doesn't matter. Okay? They're selling pounds in some way, shape, or form. Okay? So they get paid on pounds. And they also recognize that what they really need to do is optimize those pounds and their performance while still being as low a cost producer as they can. So as we think about genetic programs for them, those are the things they're going to focus on. They're going to do that through tools like crossbreeding. They're going to do that using tools with inbreed like your APDs and the mating system that they, uh, they offer. Just a little bit on feeder cattle because we're uh, we're in the heart of feeder cattle land here, uh, as you all recognize. Um, carcass traits get an awful lot of attention, and they're critically important. I don't, uh, I don't want to stand here and say that they're not, um, but to our mainstream primary cow calf producer uh, that resides in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, to the southeast, if you will, okay, most of them are not paid on carcass traits. Okay. They make money by selling pounds of feeder calf on a whole herd basis. Pounds of calf wean per cow exposed. That's what's really important to them. Okay. 
What are the most important traits relative to pounds of cat weight per cow exposed? All right, wait, since you, you quiz people, this is quiz for you. Traits. What are the traits? Growth. Fertility. Fertility. Survivability. The ERT. The economically relevant ones, you're right. Okay, we'll come back to that. Okay. We also know that those calves are going to have a future home, whether that guy retains ownership or they go to a feedlot. Okay. We know that there are huge differences between sires, and this is some data from my good friend Daryl Busby at Iowa State. Um, we participated in their Tri-County Retain Ownership Program. Uh, they do an excellent job tracking individual known sires in a commercial feedlot setting and identifying profit differences between sires in that system. And, and the results are very substantial. You get down here at the bottom and you put profitability of that camp over his lifetime. Uh, there's easily, this is last year's data, 2014. Um, what are you looking at there? $150 difference between a calf sired by the top third and a calf sired by the bottom third relative to sire value. The interesting thing, if you really study through this data, it's bulls that combine all these things really well. Whoops. Bulls that combine all these traits really well are the bulls that, that really excel. Okay? Tend to optimize growth, optimize carcass traits, optimize all these things. You find very few outliers in the upper third that are really, really good for one trait. They're balanced up across the board. Okay? Lots of data out there which relates profitability to these traits. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move through a few of these. Gordon did an excellent job. I'm going to uh, just highlight and, and reemphasize the importance to our commercial cow calf sector, the importance of a profitable cow. Remember, most of her profit is derived from her ability to number one, breed, number two, have a calf, number three, wean a calf. Right? Then she needs to do it cheaply, and she needs to produce a calf that fits the marketplace. How do we design her? How do we as seed stock producers help make this a better cow and a more functional cow, and ultimately one that's profitable? Several ways to do that. Okay? We've touched on the maternal heterosis thing. I'm not going to um, go through this again, other than to reemphasize that, the, in my mind, the reason to crossbreed is to have a crossbred cow. Okay? Individual heterosis is great, paternal heterosis and fertility and crossbred bulls great, but really it's about the cow. Okay? Gordon touched on this as well, and I stole this slide from uh, a friend of this audience, Dr. Tom Field. And I think the thing to re-emphasize is over here at the right-hand side. Dr. Jones talked about most of these very important traits are low inheritability. Okay? They respond greatly to heterosis, but they hugely impact our production costs and our revenue in a very favorable way. Okay? I share with producers all the time, can you have too much reproduction? Is that possible? I know it's before lunch, that's a yes or no question. <laughs> can you have too much reproduction? No. Can too many of them live? No. no. Okay. No. Okay. We don't have to worry about optimizing, do we? We want to maximize that. Okay. So we've got traits that will help us do that. You folks have excellent EPDs which help us do that. I think the thing we need to think about is doing it on both sides of the equation. Number one, on the productivity side, the output side, if you will, we have excellent tools to manage things like cabin ease, growth, maternal ability, ultimately carcass merit. We also have tools which help us emphasize and select for and manage cost of production from a genetic standpoint. Okay? We can manage stability, longevity, reproduction, mature size, no production. What EPD tools do we have to help us do both of them? 
I know Wade knows the answer to this question. We have indexes, right? Indexes help us balance that. Okay? That's what an API does. Helps us balance those two. What's the suite of traits that are important uh, in there to help us balance those two and move forward in a positive direction? Okay? Question I get all the time. So how do we benchmark? I'm going to buy a Sim Angus Bull Dump Trimmer. All right? I've been using straight Angus, or pretty much straight Angus genetics. <coughs> How do I benchmark what kind of a bull I'm going to buy? Okay. I'm going to throw a couple slides at you to help you think about that process. This is your pre percentile table, which you're all familiar with. These are purebred bulls. Okay. The red line under each one of those columns, or handful of them that I selected, represent the average genetic merit of an Angus bull on a crossbreed basis in your percentile table. Does that make sense? Average Angus genetics fall where in your purebred semitol percentile table? Okay? As you might guess, they're off the chart for birth weight. Right? Very low birth weight breed. Okay? 80th percentile for weaning weight, somewhere between 30 and 35 for yearling weight, 70th percentile for milk, off the chart for marbling, and down here, off the other end of the chart, for ribeye. Okay. Three differences, that's all we're defining here in a little different context. Good. So whereas Simitol and Simangus breeders, hybrid Simitol breeders, do we need to design the genetics to complement this? Okay. And we could sit around a table and have philosophical discussions about that, uh, which would be a lot of fun. But between now and lunch, we don't have that time. So I took your most popular use sires, published on your website, and I pulled out the pure red bulls, all right? And I plotted them with these green stars. That's where they fall. The average, most popular, pure red cinnatol bull used in your breed. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Yeah. And I, what I would say is I think you're on track very much on track, okay? Those bulls are 